I can't hear you, Lauren. Let's try this again. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> welcome to Tomato Talk Live. I'm Lauren. Yes, welcome, welcome. I'm Jen. I think our smiles are going to be permanently implanted on our yes. faces today. My face already hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so today is going to be a very memorable day for me for three reasons. One is it's the 40th anniversary of my very first concert, Duran Duran, at the Meadowlands, April 5th, 1984. Wow. Second is we had an earthquake <laughs> in New Jersey and an aftershock only like 45 minutes ago. So anything oh. can happen. And the third, what's the third, Jen? We have Craig LaHolier on our show tonight. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I'm very excited. Thank you all for being here. If it's your first time watching, welcome. We come on the first Friday of each month at this time to talk tomatoes. Um, we, oh Jen God. and I, we each have our YouTube channels, but we also run a Facebook group with our friend Kina. It's called uh, Tomato Lovers Collective and Swap. And let me put the link for the little brand up there. It's a real collective for tomato enthusiasts of all beginners, more advanced. Um, and we're much more than a seed swap, right, Jen? Oh, yes. My goodness. It's it's more of a place to make friends than anything else. Yeah, make friends, celebrate Great the friends. tomato. Mm -hmm. We have resource sheets, breeder resource sheets, all the micro dwarfs that we know of. Are, uh, they're all, it's really the place, the all encompassing um, place for a tomato lover. Yep. And, and, if then, you're, and if you're not addicted, you will be. Right. <laughs> tomato heads and tomato heads in training are the way we look at it. Yes. Um, and so we're all, we're very happy to have you here with us. We're going to bring our special guest on in just a minute, Craig LaHoulier. I've been saying Craig LaHoulier for like yeah, years. Same. I said it wrong. If you guys <laughs> don't know, he's the author of this, like the fancy tomato it up. Bible. Yeah, I know. I was like making it all fancy. And I asked him just today and he's like, no, it's LaHoulier. And he, on the Joe Campbell mm -hmm. show, the Joe Gardner show, he was okay. saying LaHoulier. And we were telling Craig before the show, I'm like, I'm pretty uh -huh. sure Joe Lample knows how to pronounce it better than I do. Oh, yeah. Um, so he, he wrote this epic tomatoes that was published. My favorite, my favorite book. <laughs> and this this guy um, mm -hmm. from the same publisher, Growing Vegetables and Straw Bales. Um, so we've been taking questions from a lot of you. We've seen that so many of you are chatting away already. And we are an interactive broadcast, right, Jen? Yes. We like to bring your comments on the screen as well. And I know many of you are going to want to talk to Craig. So, oh, um, yeah. yep, just like just like that. Thank you, Michael. Uh -huh. Michael, our producer <laughs> back here, hey, Michael. Um, and we've got people from all over the world who have stayed up very, very late to watch Craig. So I had a bio for Craig. What did I do with it? Here it is. Well, he's, he's the author of Epic Tomatoes and Growing Vegetables and Straw Bales. As I said, he lives in North Carolina with his wife. Um, he is also the the um, co-founder of the Dwarf Tomato Project. He's an educator and a really humble, great guy. And for Jen and I, when we started this show back in last June, I think. Yeah, I think Craig so. It was always like a maybe someday for us. Yeah, like a dream. That day is here. So let's, <laughs> let's bring him on, introducing everybody, Craig LaHoulier. Hi, Craig. I, I, I need to get my wife in here to listen to all these <laughs> wonderful things. You know, as I was waiting, you had that little spinning tomato going, and I was thinking, oh, my God, they're going to hypnotize me before I come on. Here I am. <laughs> and then you mentioned Duran Duran, and I had to think back to my first concert, which was Black Sabbath when I was 16 years old. You with saw Black, Black Sabbath? Yes, oh, so and cool. with with Black Oak, Arkansas, who was not very great. Black Sabbath was very loud. Everybody in there was very high, and I was very young. So don't ask me. <laughs> well, there you go. Don't ask me too much about that. And the, <laughs> and I went to see Pink Floyd the next week, which I remember less about. Oh, anyway, I'm sure. I'm sure. That, that was then. This is now, and I'm totally okay to talk to you. <laughs> It's funny that you mentioned Black Sabbath because we were telling Bill Yoder our, our last episode wow. in um, March that Black Sabbath would make a great name for a tomato because, you know, he does like the rock stars. He's got Prince, yeah. he's got the new Depeche Mode, and he's got yeah. actually Duran Duran is coming yeah. up next. Um, so I'm like, Black Sabbath, that sounds like a name yeah. for a really cool black tomato. It, you know, it, it, 
in in our dwarf project, we've pretty much stung to uh, stuck to flowers, pets, family members. So yeah, we need to yeah. up our game a little bit. But you know, <laughs> nice thing to aspire to. Rock bands. What a, what a concept. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I don't I don't want to ignore our audience. We've got so many. We've already got 90 live viewers and we've only oh been on for God, five minutes. Really? So usually they kind of um, come. And if you're watching from Instagram, by the way, welcome. This is something new that StreamYard wow. has allowed us to do. <laughs> but just know that they will cut us off after an hour. And I think we may go over an hour. So We've got Peppered Moth. Wish I could stay to watch, but it will be midnight in the UK. Oh, oh it's Liz. Liz still. Sorry to miss you, Liz. But thank you for trying. Um, we love to incorporate all of you into the episodes. Um, Cheryl Wilson's here. Hi, Cheryl. Going to stay as long as I can. Kids are coming over to surprise me for my birthday tomorrow. Oh, happy, happy birthday. birthday. And we've got some very excited people here to see mm -hmm. Craig. Ramonte's yeah, seeing... here. Ramonte's staying up late from Lithuania. You know Ramonte? No, oh. but I'm seeing a lot of familiar names from people who have caught me on Instagram and I've sent seeds to over the years. This is like a it's like a family family reunion in part. So this is nice. Oh, cool. We have I, I think I need to be on that list, by the way, to get seeds too. <laughs> yeah. Over the years. I don't need you. <laughs> sure, sure. I am yeah, the, the cupboard's pretty bare this year. I think I went through somewhere around 1100 manila coin envelopes wow um wow. and they are wow. everywhere they're in gosh the the amazon jungle and poland <laughs> and china and germany and all over it's to think of my little babies growing in all these gardens i know terrible. isn't that wonderful i love that yeah. part of it i have one little baby we had an accidental <laughs> cross in our garden uh years ago a nana noir and an unknown cherry i call it banana <laughs> noir and so I've given out so mm. many seeds for it. Mm. It's like a minute, it looks like a miniature version of a uh, Nana And it's very, I can't imagine how you must feel, Craig, because my one little baby, <laughs> it's very cool to send them all over the world. Yeah. It, it's really weird. You know, since we've been doing the Dwarf Tomato Project for 18 years, it, which is a ridiculously long time, but they mm. were, we kept finding interesting things. But we pretty much, or I should say, I pretty much formally ended it in December just because you have to end it sometime. And so we're tidying things up for the next year or two and uh, still great stuff coming out. I think we're up to 157 varieties, which Victory are selling and watching them percolate into other seed companies is what's really cool. Um, so I mean, our, really our bottom up, movement. yeah, it, it, well, we, we did a project with lots of volunteers and amateurs and the pay for the project was horrible because it was zero. You know, right. so none of us got anything. <laughs> But we do get the satisfaction of seeing the varieties we created be loved or not loved or thrive or succumb to disease. All of these things is what you learn when you put your babies out there. You learn about where they thrive and where they may struggle because we don't know the answer to that even yet. So it is an ongoing project that will continue to be able to track hopefully for decades and then they become heirlooms. It's not, we can't call them heirlooms yet, but someday we may be able to. Yeah, can you, that's an age old question, it seems, in yeah. the tomato world. What constitutes yeah. an heirloom? What's the difference between that, open pollinated? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, people get really confused right. and people take advantage of it. So like a, a, a fancy restaurant will charge you a fortune for an heirloom tomato plate. Right. And it will have big beef and sun gold, which are two hybrids. So right. nothing even remotely. And, you know, I found that if you ask them to take some money off because they're not heirlooms, they don't like that very much. <laughs> um, I've made myself an annoyance in so many restaurants over the years. I have no doubt. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you've got a hybrid, right? Hybrid is a created variety by crossing pollen onto flower and the seeds in the developed tomato are the hybrid that end up in the packet. So that's why they're more expensive, sun gold. The opposite of hybrid is open pollinated, meaning it's been grown out for years, it's stable. So you grow a Cherokee purple, you grow a green zebra, you get a Cherokee purple or green zebra. Heirloom, many open pollinated are heirlooms, but I like to reserve that name for things that are older than 1950. And I use that because that's the year Burpee came out with Big Boy, the first oh. hybrid that people grew. Once people saw how profitable that was for Burpee, almost all seed companies then went to creating and selling hybrids. And so I really, that's just my arbitrary cutoff point. Anything that's open pollinated, that's older than 1950, 
I refer to as an heirloom. And I got to realize I'm getting older. I've been doing this tomato thing for 40 years now, mm -hmm. so maybe I have to change that date a little bit. But any of our dwarf tomato project varieties, they're open pollinated. But I would want another 30 or 50 years to see who's still growing them and if they're cherished to be able to start calling them heirlooms. Yeah, because a lot of the newer things that are coming out, they're calling heirlooms, even though they're oh. open pollinated. And I always thought, well, that's kind of strange because you think heirloom is... It's a buzz term. And we live yeah. in an age where, you know, whatever's on the seed catalog cover, whatever people talk about, a lot of people flock to. And I'm just a crotchety old curmudgeonly <laughs> dude who wants to grow the stuff that's delicious and has stood the test of time. So I'll stick with heirlooms only because I think we're turning away from them a little bit. And essentially, we will come back to them again because we have to, because all of a sudden, a lot of these heirlooms are starting to go obsolete again. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm there to kind of pick up the pieces and keep them going under the surface, if I can do that. We have our friend Heidi here, our mutual friend Heidi. Hey, Heidi, Heidi, Heidi. Hi, Heidi. How are you? Hi, Heidi. <laughs> um, Heidi and I write yeah. these great emails to each other on occasion. Uh, why should I write a tomato book when I, when I can write an email to Heidi and vice versa? <laughs> she, she's like my tomato therapist. <laughs> and, uh, Heidi's you know, wonderful. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so many people whose names I'm seeing go by are just, you know, really great gardeners and really great people. So it's, uh, you know, we, we had a pre-meeting last night. And I think the last thing I said is gardeners have to save the world because as everybody's blowing each other to bits, we find a way to just coalesce around a common love and an interest. And mm -hmm. so it's pretty good. We're pretty important, even though a lot Something of people probably similar. don't realize it. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, Brandy Murphy says, hey all, hello, Craig. I bought your books and learned so much. So thank you from the bottom of my freshly planted tomatoes. <laughs> Y'all are amazing people. <laughs> Thanks, Brandy. <laughs> thank you, Brandy. And you know, you mentioned the book and one frustrating thing to me is I wrote most of that book in 2012 and 13. Here we are in 2024. I think 90% of that book or 95% is still current, but I would love story someday, or they're now ha the Hachette group to say, okay, it's been a while. We'd like you to refresh it. You know, I think there should be extended chapters on straw bale gardening, maybe something about hydroponics, something about greenhouses, but I wrote what I knew. And in 10 years, I've learned more. So one of the reasons I use my Instagram lives each week is to make the book come alive and refresh things that are in the book that may have changed through the years, like my favorite tomatoes or things like that. There are ways to keep the information fresh. And I just appreciate the people who actually watch this sweaty dude in his Hendersonville garden with a dog <laughs> sitting in his lap, licking his face, um, share all the tomato stuff. It's, it's really a lot of fun. I know why you guys do this because it's, you're, you're teaching and that's in your sharing that's really important to catch when when do you do your instagram lives what day of the week is that that's a frustrating question for people who the, so the covid year and the two years after that maybe the year after that this is my fifth year doing them i like to keep to a steady part of the week but i seem to have a lot of events in the spring this year so it's like, man, I haven't done one in a week and I'll just pop in Sunday okay. at like two o'clock in the afternoon, but I save them all so that people get notified I'm on. And if they miss it, they can actually go back and Great. see it and see all the questions. And so there's four years plus of weirdo me sitting in my <laughs> art doing Instagram no, it's, lives. It's <laughs> I kind of do that with some of my lives also. It's like whenever day I can find some time, I go on, not this, Jen and I have these pre-scheduled. Yeah. Um, to find Craig on Instagram, he's at NC Tomato Man. Yep. You can check out his channel and his website is craigjulier.com. <laughs> and, and it's funny, I'm looking at um, some of the questions popping like, we need to know Craig's favorite tomatoes. Ah, that's something <laughs> I guess we do have to talk about. And you know, the, the list has changed based on, so when we moved into Hendersonville in 2020, I had just missed a, a, a tomato breeder that passed away six months before we moved in, Millard Murdoch, who mm -hmm. lived in Flat Rock. Flat Rock's only, we go by Flat Rock all the time. So his Captain Lucky and his Abraham Brown have bumped some tomatoes off my top 10 or 12 list. And I'm only growing 12 tomatoes this year and two of them are his, um, <laughs> which is just, I know. It's, <laughs> and, and, 
this is now a point of pride for me because I've so I've told so many people this is what I'm doing that if I don't do it, I'm going to look like a total idiot and a liar and all that. <laughs> so I'm going to grow a 12. I'm impressed. Maybe. That's cr crazy to me. <laughs> this is the least tomatoes I've grown since um, my first or second year of gardening back in 1981, 1982. And um, I want to see if I can squeeze every bit of productivity out of those 12 plants by giving them each their own straw bale and really being totally observant of the critters munching on the leaves and the, the spots of fungal diseases. Um, it's going to be fun. So being a scientist, I have to create science projects for me in the garden and this mm -hmm. year it's going to be maximizing the yield one plant per bale i haven't decided if i'm going to double stake well i'm going to double stake it but am, am i going to do two stems per stake one stem per stake these things i'll figure out as time goes on i want to show you guys a, a photo i think <laughs> i have it of craig <laughs> in the straw bales this is craig and Look joe joe yeah. lample who is that guy? No. Yeah, yeah, I know Joe Lample. <laughs> Tell us about growing in straw bales. Yes, um, please. I'm yeah. doing it this year. I need to know everything. <laughs> it's great. And, you know, so I went from in-ground gardening to driveway gardening and containers because the trees around our, the garden that I hand dug in Raleigh in 1992, it lost its sun over time. And the only place that got the sun was the driveway. So that's have container. a photo of that too. Oh, oh wow. there you the driveway. go. So that's the driveway. And you know, the homeowners association, they didn't know what to do about that. <laughs> so you kill them with kindness, meaning you give them produce and they <laughs> say it's works. okay. Buy them off. <laughs> so the thing with container gardening is it's great because it allows you to grow things where the sun shines best in your yard. You can, you know, if you've got a perfect plot of land, but it only gets three hours of sun, you're not going to be able to grow large fruited, really great tomatoes. But if you've got a patio or a deck where you can put containers or straw bales, containers, you have to fill them with something. And that is the cost of doing container gardening is typically paying for good quality material to put into them, but they do great. Straw bales give you the equivalent of two 20 gallon containers per one, six, seven, eight dollar straw bale. Plus, at the end of the season, this wonderful loamy mulch that you can use in future years in your garden. You just have to turn that hard, rough, scratchy straw bale into a compost bin. And you do that by hitting it with a nitrogen source, alternating days for a week, watering every day, and then hitting it with a balanced food, a 10, 10, 10, or, or if you're strictly organic, an Espoma 565, something like that. The end of two weeks, you're ready to go. And the plants, because the core of that straw bale starts chewing up and making the environment for the roots. You don't have to add any dirt really, except to fill in the crevice you make. When you part the bale and you slip your plant in, there's always a little space. Put a little potting mix in there. Otherwise it makes its own soil. Last year, my squash direct seeded into straw bales started bearing in 37 days from seed. So wow. the, heat, the heat of the bale, advances the maturity dates on things. Um, I was picking 30 to 35 pounds of tomatoes per plant, two plants per bale, that's 70 pounds of tomatoes per straw bale. Oh, wow. Even letting them kind of like look like crap by the time you get exhausted in mid-August and late August and the disease comes in and the critters come in, you get enough to do what you want, can them and such. You know, that's kind of what tomato growers do. Mm -hmm. We get exhausted. Right. Yep. And then you're like, it's time to let the garden look really, really ugly. Yeah. And <laughs> then you the, just walk away from it till like January. <laughs> you, you, well, you have to pick it all up. When you, when you do straw bale gardening, it's not like you can just say, okay, you're done. Like I used to do in Raleigh with my regular garden. You know, there's cages out there and little bits of plants. You need the backyard again. So, you know, everything has to get removed but it's such a relief. And I am such a seasonal leader, my wife or I. So our first tomato we eat is the first one in late June, early July. And the last tomato we eat is late August, early September. Unless it's something we can or make sauce out of, we do not eat a single tomato at any other point during the year. That is how much of a tomato snob we Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just not worth paying for something that's cardboardy oh, or, it's, or punky. It's or, awful. Yeah. yeah. Now, anybody who's watching that's from the commercial tomato selling business and greenhouses, I'm sorry, that's just me. Oh, they have <laughs> to know. They have to know that they're awful. <laughs> 
You know, I, the first time I went to a, a Whole Foods and uh, saw, oh, they have heirlooms, $3.99 oh. a pound. And yeah. you get a nice heirloom and you put it on the scale and they're like, that's $7.16. You're like, what? For mm -hmm. one tomato? And you take it home and cut it and the texture is like horrendous. It's not the same. It they may look the same on the outside, but they're not the same. You, you can actually tell time. because the shine isn't quite right. The right. feel of it isn't quite right. And, you know, when you get into this hobby deep enough, it's amazing the things you can just infer. And I'm not a tomato smeller. When people come to my garden and start grabbing the tomatoes and smelling them, I'm like, <laughs> what are you smelling for? It's not a melon. It's a, it's a tomato. I've never smelled a tomato in my life. I cut them and I eat them. But I don't think you can gain a whole lot from the smell. It's funny unless they're, unless that. they're going bad. Unless they're going bad. I've noticed the same thing that, because yeah. a lot of um, vendors will talk about the aroma. And yeah. I, maybe, I, and I, I know you do it, Jen, in your videos. I yeah. tend to not, and I'm like, maybe I should start smelling the tomato. But that doesn't, there, there's some, some of them smell weird, but then yeah. taste good. Right. That's and then true. vice versa. But mm. now, I mean, I, I think that some of them do have a nice aroma and others do not. I've not, you know, my wife like says. Formaldehyde I'm sometimes. My wife says I'm hard of smelling. So maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe that, is, yeah, is, yeah, I know some people true. can't smell anything, you know, in yeah. some situations, that's a good thing. So this is my buddy. I call her Malachite Jen. She and I, our oh, favorite yeah. tomato is Malachite Box. The two oh, of us. I've grown it. Um, yeah, yep. Oh, love it. In fact, she made yeah. me this mug, Malachite Twins. She says, thanks to Craig for being on Lauren and Jen's show. We oh. may be a small audience, but we're an enthusiastic group of tomato heads. Thank uh, Jen. You know, tomato, tomato is the crop. And it, it, it's amazing to understand that it is a crop that's in 95 plus percent of every garden in the world, probably. And it is always interesting to run into people that have bought my plants and say, I grow them because I love the look of them and it's fun, but I don't like tomatoes. Or they say, I'll only eat them cooked. So there's there's room for all types in the tomato sure. world. Yeah. I am astounded at people that can't eat a ripe tomato, but you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't trust those people. <laughs> Yeah, I'm astounded at people that won't eat a green tomato because they oh, they have yeah, these visions in their mind of like an unripe tomato. It. They're like, it's I know. not ripe. I'm I like, if there are tomatoes that are green when ripe and they're delicious. You know, when I started um, selling seedlings back in probably 1998, um, so I, I would bring 150 varieties to the farmer's market as plants. And initially it was like, my family will only eat red tomatoes. And so I'd say, okay. These are good red tomatoes, and I'm going to give you a white one. I'm going to give you a yellow one. I'm going to give you a chocolate one. Within five years, they would want the Russell Stover's box. I want one of those, one of those, one of those. So it's all about education. And grocery right. stores teach us <clears throat> what our produce is supposed to look like. Green peppers, red, well, sickly, pink, anemic-looking tomatoes. And green peppers are really unripe peppers, aren't yeah, they? Well, all peppers, peppers are meant to be red or another color, but not green. And for me, eating a green pepper is like going out and chomping on the lawn. I just yeah, don't I agree. like it. I always <laughs> let them go whatever color they're going to end up because the vitamin C shoots up, the sweetness shoots up. Oh, they're so good sautéed and stuff. Oh, I, I know. So oh, I yeah. like major in tomatoes, minor in peppers, minor in eggplants, you know. Yeah, yeah. They're all fun. So Ramonte says, hello, your majesty, father of dwarf tomatoes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> She's all the way from Lithuania. So, so the Watch father me. of dwarf tomatoes makes it sound like I have a gene in me that makes my offspring <laughs> really short. And we're all tall in my family. I noticed, a question, I noticed a question that went by a little while ago talking about comparing the growth of heirloom tomatoes to dwarf tomatoes and dwarf tomatoes are just tomatoes so they germinate the same they look different right away because right from the start they are half of the height of the indeterminate types and they maintain that half height all through their growth habit and you know people want so much specificity about their tomatoes they want days to maturity they want how tall it gets and what, what I end up having to tell them often is there are too many variables to make that information reliable. So right. you could say a tomato is 60 days, but how big is your seedling? How many degree days are you getting to grow? That 60-day tomato could be a 90-day tomato in Seattle, and it could be a 45-day tomato in Seattle. I mean, in North Florida. So dwarf tomatoes, if you just go on the, the premise that they will be half the height of an indeterminate, that way, if by the end of your season, you have a 10-foot Cherokee purple, you will have a 5-foot dwarf. But it's still easier to handle 
than a 10 foot tomato. Yeah. Yeah. And if you get absolute full sun all day long, you will keep some of these dwarfs down to three feet tall or four feet tall. There is minor variation, variety to variety, but it is quite minor once you've grown them all. Uh, we grew 65 of them in a greenhouse last year, and they, they all perform pretty much identically in terms of height. But you know, but the flavors and the fruit shapes and the right. colors, that's what it, that's what the fun of it was. So just kind of do the same thing. Just plant them the same way. You don't have to start them sooner. Plant them when you plant other tomatoes, because the maturity dates of the dwarfs are just like indeterminate. Some are 60 or some are early, some are mid-season, some are late season. And it's, you know, that's why I kind of argue with Victory about how much information they put next to each tomato, because I don't I don't want to set false expectations. I'd rather a loose range be given and let people kind of discover it themselves. Now, can a dwarf be an indeterminate? Um, a or, dwarf, or is it like a semi-determinate? It is, it's a third completely different type. So there's indeterminate, there's determinate, and there's dwarf. And the dwarf gene gives it a thick central stem, crinkly looking foliage, the growth habit that's half, half the um, rate, um, but, it fruits like an indeterminate. So a determinant shoots up to three feet, fruits everywhere, you harvest a ton of it, and then you throw the plant away. It's, you know, taxi, Roma. Whereas a dwarf will fruit like an indeterminate throughout okay. the season, but it does not need any pruning. In fact, determinants and dwarfs should not be pruned at all in terms of the flowering clusters, because you'll just blast the potential yield. But you can, they're very dense plants. They're gorgeous plants. But because of the density, they can be prone to a little bit of foliage disease in areas where they're not getting enough sun or air circulation. So you can go in and snip off some of the inner foliage to open the plant up and let the air through. And that will help to keep down some of the foliage diseases. Oh, that's helpful to know. Um, Anna says, I'm growing Katie did Sweet Sue and Buddy's Heart. I'm not sure if I'm missing anyone, but they'll have their own very their own their very own corner. So you have yeah, so Anna, you're growing a tomato I named after my daughter, Caitlin, a tomato oh. I named after my wife, Susan, and it's probably my favorite dwarf, and one I named after my beloved chocolate lab buddy. So oh. those, those were all named by me, and they're all just really, really good. So Great. Sweet Sue is your favorite dwarf? It's in the top 10. Okay. It, it is, and it's a dwarf that is really for people who like a full flavored tomato, but like an, a clear element of sweetness to it. Hmm. Where, whereas something like Dwarf Blazing Beauty, which is orange, is full flavored, but it has a clear element of tartness to it. So it kind of tickles your tongue when you take a bite out of it. And it's, you know, I could go through all 157 dwarfs and categorize them. Well, we can, we've got time for yeah, that. We've got go. time let's for go. that. Let's do it. <laughs> I think somebody asked about the classification of dwarfs. At our Dwarf tomatoes are open pollinated, just like Cherokee chocolate, um, Cherokee green, which are more recent varieties that I obtained by growing out Cherokee purple and, and playing with the mutations. So someday, some of the dwarf tomatoes, I think, will be heirlooms because people decide maybe they'll be widely uh, adaptable all over the country. And so people from Florida and Texas up to Vancouver may say, wow, Sweet Sue is great no matter where I plant it. And 50 years from now, it'll still be grown. Yeah, we'll call it an heirloom at that point. This point, I like to call them future heirlooms. I like that. that that's kind of what they are. And even, even Tom Wagner's Green Zebra to me, and you know, he came to one of my talks in Seattle, and I think he was there to joust with me because we're, we're on opposite coasts and he kind of got insulted, I think, that I don't call his tomato an heirloom, but I explained why <laughs> and he was kind of okay with it. And I sold him my book and I signed it for him. So we're <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Kristen says dwarf tomatoes have been quite a godsend to those of us with limited garden space. That sentence makes me so happy because we create, Petrina and I and our team of a thousand people over the years created them because we thought, uh, well, another, I'll tell another interesting anecdote. When um, we were doing this, I was setting them, I was contacting different seed companies to see if they're interested in carrying some. Mike Dunton at Victory jumped at it. Um, you know, Re uh, Remy at, um, you know, poor Remy, she passed away and she had a great seed company whose name I can't remember right now. Um, Oh, Heritage Seeds was interested in Jeff Casey up in Canada, Sand Hill and Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Fruition. 
So they all get on the ground floor of some of these varieties, Tatiana. And I called Rob Johnson at Johnny's and he's like, this is years ago. This is probably 2008, 2009. And Rob and I are good friends now, but he said, uh, we just, you know, we're more catering to market gardeners for farms and things. We don't think that there's going to be a big call for container varieties of tomatoes. And I'm like, ah, Rob, you were wrong. And that <laughs> sentence to me, Petrina and I envisioned envisaged that there would be because so many people at the farmer's market used to say, what have you got great and I can grow it in a container and it tastes wonderful like an heirloom. And there were very, very few candidates for that sentence. And so what our project did is fill in some candidates for people who are container gardeners to enjoy all of the joy that uh, heirloom tomatoes, tomatoes grow. And in a blind tasting, I could probably say that many of our dwarfs are just as good as many of the best indeterminate. So oh, I think it's kind of a mission accomplished thing. Dwarf uh, awesome uh, for me last year. Yeah. It was awesome. That was one of the best tomatoes I've grown. Um, those of you that have been here before, you know, but I keep forgetting to announce that we're giving away some awesome sauce prizes tonight. Make sure you type in hashtag tomato anywhere in the comments. Um, we have um, John is giving away. He's ordered two copies of Craig's book, a paperback um and a hardcover craig is going to sign them and ship it to whoever the winners are and include some seeds along with it so thank you craig and john yep. um jen is also yes, giving away you. a copy of the book yeah. craig's yeah. craig's going to do a nameplate yeah. for it yeah yep 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 and then i'm giving away some dwarf tomato seeds um Good. so make sure you type in hashtag tomato somewhere what? today one person asked a question about Bing, and I'm going back to see who that was. Ah, here it is, James Maxwell. So Bing is a family heirloom that's not commercially available yet, but I share things with Bill, Seed Savers Exchange member, and I want him to list them because I want people to grow them before Victory Seeds, who is the typical company to offer them, gets them out there. That way they've got a little bit of experience. So Bing is a variety that was sent to me by a family that claims it has a World War II European um, relationship. So one of these that came across. Now, when I, when I grow Bing, the person who sent it to me, I believe they live in the Midwest, and it's unusual in being a almost round red beefsteak type. And I'm looking at where the tomato came from, and I'm wondering if the real Abraham Lincoln, of which I still have not seen an authentic version of it. Really? May look, it's supposed to be bronzy colored leaf, and it's supposed to be a pound or more, and every and, and scarlet. And of every source I've tried, it's either potato leaf, which is wrong, or it's medium sized, which is wrong. And, and Sh the Shumway company actually admitted in the 70s that they let Abraham Lincoln become crossed and they lost the strain. Oh, so I've been looking for the real thing for 50 years. Bing is probably very much what the original Abraham look, Lincoln looked like. So uh, James, if you want to share your impressions of that tomato with me, it's a weird looking plant and uh, it, it just suckers everywhere. But man, the tomatoes are big and round and delicious. Well, so. I guarantee Sing. you in the group come see Seeking Saturday yeah. tomorrow, everybody's oh, going to want to get Bing, 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 Bing. So our, <laughs> our friend Heidi says Remy is from Sample Seed Shop. That's it. Thank you, Heidi. Aww. And Remy is a wonderful person. Thanks, Heidi. I think, was it two years ago she must have passed away? And she, she really allowed people access to the most wonderful tomatoes. Kim, that's really nice for you to say. And that kind of the fact that... Um, people who are um, physically uh, unable to deal with, you know, 12 foot monsters and stakes, they're really good for that. And I think children's gardens. Um, yeah. So if, if master gardener groups, if I speak for them and I finally have a children's master gardener, uh, a children's garden, I always say, please, you know, let's, I need to get you some dwarf seeds so you can grow them out. And, you know, children can come and look at a plant that's their height and see all the different colored yes. tomatoes growing. So that's great. And I, and I knew we talked yesterday. I'm, I'm in love with micro dwarves. Um, I grow them <laughs> yeah. indoors. In yeah. The winter. Look um, at that. Yeah. Look, one gallon grow bag, put a saucer underneath. Yeah. And so Michael, our producer, he and I have, were like, why is there no micro dwarf tomato project? Um, in fact, Michael wanted me to ask you that. I see you back there. Michael. One of my babies here too. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> there actually are, various micro dwarf projects that have been ongoing out there. I'm not sure if they've consolidated into one yet or if 
if they're still going. Because uh, I think once we did the Dwarf Tomato Project, that was that was really the next place for groups to go. I never developed. I'm interested in it, but, uh, but micro dwarfs have not done well in the climates I've gardened because of the humidity. So they tend to get quite heavily foliage disease. And the other thing is, I'm not a huge, aside from sun gold and egg yolk and a few others, Mexico midget, I'm not a cherry tomato lover once the slicers come in. Right. My plants actually pretty much stay with fruits on them and I go right for the, the big fellas. That's just me. Um, I, I, I've got a thing for one pound heirloom colorful beefsteaks. And, uh, but I know there are many people that absolutely adore cherry tomatoes, and which is great. I mean, sun gold may be the, my favorite tomato of all. And is that right? Cherry, mm -hmm. oh, because I've never found a tomato that has an equivalent complexity of flavor. And the fact that if you pick it pale orange, it's acidic. And if you pick it medium orange, it's mellow. And if you pick it dark orange, it's as sweet as candy. So it's kind of a tri-use and it is a hybrid. And many people have saved seeds from it and tried to get a replica of it and nobody's quite hit the mark yet. See, I'm looking through your book because you've got a page in here devoted to my favorite cherry. And now, it, now I'm not finding it, Coyote. Coyote. I love coyote. Ah. And you've got an entire page. Yes. Why do I think it's 113 in my head? If that's right, I, that's really pathetic. It's the earthquake. No, it's not 113. But it's <laughs> um, yes. I, I love it's the earthquake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, so I love coyote. I feel like the flavors are so complex. And, and sun gold's great, but but I like coyote better. So coyote is actually a very polarizing tomato. And when I grow it out and sell the seedlings, as many people can't stand it is absolutely love it so there, I is, know. A, there is a flavor Fine. component and i don't know how to I, I know what it is when i taste it and smell it um so that tomato came originally from uh, veracruz mexico and mm -hmm. the woman gave that tomato for me at a pennsylvania gardening show back and let me think it's got to be about 1988. So she comes, I, I had all my tomatoes displayed and she has this little cluster of ivory colored cherry tomatoes. Hi, my name is Mae Clement. I brought the seeds from Mexico. We, I want you to have them. And it's, it's so unique. I consider that a white or an ivory version of Mexico midget and it's weediness and, and it's fruit size. Um, I had I knew a chef who liked to make desserts out of coyote because Ooh, I of bet. the, because I the bet incredible that sweetness great. that they carry. Yeah. And it's a weed. I mean, it takes over the garden. Oh yes. I, I abuse that thing. And, yeah. and it crosses yeah. I've got I'm stabilizing a couple of coyote crosses because it crosses very easily. Yeah. This yeah. is my new friend Cordaro, but mainly his his five-year-old son Ansel, who I met <laughs> yesterday in one of my lives. He is an aspiring gardener and a tomato lover, and he sits and watches our shows, and he puts together a little wish list. So, hi, oh, Ansel. And hey. I, said, Ansel. I said I would have Craig and, and Jen say hi to Ansel. Hi, Hello, Ansel. Ansel. <laughs> Very yeah. nice to meet you. I, I always end my talk saying, go grow a gardener. And yeah. Cordero mm -hmm. is growing a gardener. Yes, That's is. the most important. Yes. You know, as you, as you can see, I'm very quiet and it's hard <laughs> to get me to talk. So I want to shut up for a minute and see if Jen and Lauren, you have anything you want me to talk about or any questions you want to highlight because uh, I could do this for five hours and not get Oh, tired. we've got five hours, my friend. <laughs> Love it. We've got five hours. <laughs> I did um, see we, a question. I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. You, no, you go, Jen. You go. Jennifer Fox, I believe it was a question long, long ago in the beginning of the chat. She asked, so you're only growing 12 varieties, right? Mm -hmm. She wanted to know what they were. I think you've told a couple of them. Yeah, Cherokee purple, chocolate green, um, potato leaf yellow. Chocolate yeah. green? Uh, all three, Cherokee green, Cherokee chocolate, Cherokee purple. Oh, okay. I thought it was a variety yeah. called chocolate no. green. I was getting ready to get, grab my notebook. Uh, <laughs> sun, sun, sun gold and egg yolk because I've abused my cherry tomatoes the last few years. And my wife said, please put one each in a straw bale so I get tons of them. Uh, oh. Captain Lucky, Abraham Brown, um, either Pol well, two of Polish Earl or brandy wine because I love the potato leaf, big pink beef steaks, but I only want to have space for two of the three. I'm not sure if I said potato leaf yellow yet. Uh, Lillian's yellow heirloom and Lucky Cross. So that's. I want to grow Lucky Cross. I have not grown <sighs> that one yet. Get the seeds from me because um, 
I, I went through a kind of a reselection of it. I went through seeds from six different lines that I grew in 2011, selecting for best color and best flavor. And so I've got some really good stuff that I can share with you on that. Oh, I, I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's really good from seed catalogs that sell it, but I think it's lost a little bit. It should taste like brandy wine, but in a yellow red form. Mm. And the latest I've tried, they've tended a little bit more type, the peachy sweet, neat, sweet fruitiness of something like pineapple, whereas Lucky mm. Crush should always be a completely different experience eating when compared to all of the other bicolor varieties. It should have that brandy wine boom. Ooh. You know. Oh. I like our, our friend Darla in the group. Did I actually like, do that? Oh I like <laughs> loud flavor. I like things yeah. with loud flavor. Yeah. Life's yeah. too short for crappy tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Malachi Jen and I say that too. I like the ones that slap you in the face. Oh yeah. 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 Slap your mama. <laughs> and, and so Lucky Cross came from the bees messed around in my garden and took some pollen from a neighboring variety and put it on a brand wine and I knew that because I saved seed from brandy wine and got some regular leaf seedlings and when I grew them out they were pink with gold stripes so and the tomato next to it had stripes so I worked on it for eight years and that's where I got it from so it's got the yellow red coloring of the bicolors that a lot of people love but it does have the genes that give it the brandy wine oomph and that's why it's the only bi bicolor and you know, I, Joe Lample and I are opposite. He loves pineapple. And mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of like, well, if you want to eat a peach, eat a peach. So yeah. for me, pineapple <laughs> is just eating a peach. It's firm, mm -hmm. it's juicy, and um, it's way too sweet and mild for me. It doesn't have that oomph, or the bam, yeah. whatever we want to call it. I agree. I'm a, I grew, I'm a bam tomato guy. <laughs> I grew a nanas and um, big rainbow years ago together. They looked like the same fruit. We like yeah. bananas better, but it's, I agree. It was still not yeah. quite enough for me. Yeah. Now they're good on a cheeseburger and they're good with grilled cheese. So if you do something to those bicolors, the mild, you get a lot of nice juicy fruitiness with them. So what else do you want to ask there, folks? Um, <laughs> tell us how Cherokee Purple came to be. Oh, gosh. Because you've introduced the entire yeah. world to Cherokee Purple. How did that happen? Yeah. So that was the, the luckiest moment in my life in terms of tomato parlance, meeting my wife on April 7th. Two days from now, 1979, yeah. was the luckiest day of my life. Um, but Cherokee <laughs> Purple, um, yeah, I was just growing a lot of heirlooms, sitting in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and a letter came in the mail. Um, I had participated in a lot of seed swaps at the time from garden magazines, National Gardening, which used to be called Gardens for All or vice versa, and Mother Earth News and things. And Mr. Green had these seeds, and he noticed I was someone that liked to collect tomatoes. And I think he was a SSE member as well. And he just sent me this packet showed up and the book actually has the letter in the back of the book is the letter that he sent with the seeds. And it says, here's a, a purple tomato. It didn't have a name that dates from hundred years ago. That's from the Cherokee Indians. And I want you to grow it. He, he sent it to me, me and Glenn Drowns. And I don't know if Glenn did much with it, but I gave it a name. I grew it. And I was like astounded because that color was in the, the whole black tomato craze was not known at that time in uh, right. 19, 1990. So gardeners are so unique because they want to share stuff that's great. And I said, uh, so I listed it in the Seed Savers Exchange. I sent it to Jeff McCormick of Southern Exposure. And he um, called me and he says, man, it looks like an ugly leg bruise. Nobody is going to want to eat <laughs> a tomato that funny looking, but I will list it in my 1993 catalog. And I'll just put the little phrase only for the very adventurous. And that's it. Nice. And it, from that point on, it, you know, and uh, Carolyn and I were doing our off the vine newsletter at the time. And I wrote about it and I sent seeds to a lot of people. So what I like the story of Cherokee Purple for, and let me give you a little bit more that I found out in talking to Mr. Green, who has since passed on, sadly. So it turns out the Cherokee Nation shared it with the grandfather of a woman named Jean Greenlee who lived in Rutledge, Tennessee. Jean met JD at some kind of an event and shared seeds with him and he shared them with me. So let's think of heirlooms stories as links in a chain. If the Cherokee Nation didn't share it, if Jean Greenlee's grandfather didn't share it, if she didn't share it with Mr. Green, if he didn't send it to me, if I didn't send it to Jeff, if he didn't list it in his catalog, and this is the fragility of heirlooms where mm -hmm. they're living packets of seeds that have to be continually grown out and shared 
for them to continue to exist. I'm just, I just feel very, very humbled to have been able to play a part in making Gosh, that. Now you can find them at Home Depot. Home Depot starts yeah, starting purple. I'm learning ah. <laughs> so another little story about um, Cherokee purple um, is that MIT um, went out and got, they did some genetic testing of tomatoes and they involved me in their um, conference call some years ago. I think they went to 50 com companies and got Cherokee purple and they, one third of them was selling black crim as Cherokee purple. One third oh, of them was selling Cherokee purple as black crim. One third yeah. of it, the genetics was so messed up, it couldn't even be identified. So wow. if, the, and I'm going to make this general, the cautionary tale here is if, so I've, all of the Cherokee purple I grow can trace back to the seed sample in 1990 because I've created a very complex family tree. And I always try to grow seed that's as close to the beginning as I can. And I know what it's supposed to look and taste like. Cool. And I can go to farmer's markets. I can go to tastings and look at a tomato and say, ah, it's not Cherokee purple. Oh. Cherokee purple does not concentric crack. Black crim does, meaning around oh, Cherokee okay. purple radially cracks, if it cracks at all, because it actually is quite uh, crack tolerant. But um, it does occasionally throw a mutation, uh, which I found. So Cherokee chocolate seemed to be a skin color mutation of Cherokee purple. Cherokee green seems to be a flesh color muta mutation of Cherokee chocolate. So mu mutations hmm. happen, but they are rare and you've got to be lucky to find one. But my, and I'm, I'm referencing, somebody said Cherokee purple seems to be unstable. What it is, is just that there is a lot of less than careful seed saving going on, mislabels, seeds of different varieties getting caught under fingernails and then included in packets. Mm. Seed companies that aren't being really careful about either isolating their varieties or saving seed. So the state of heirlooms right now is actually a bit confused. You got eBay power sellers, you got Amazon sellers. Right. And I think a lot of people are selling seeds to make money, but they don't, ex may, they may never have even grown the variety out or know what it's supposed to look like. So if, if you get seeds from an heirloom and it's supposed to be great and it really does poorly for you, don't give up on the variety, change your seed source because there really is a lot of junk out there. And unfortunately, when I look at the Ferry Morse Cherokee purple packet, that's not Cherokee purple. So wow. it's, that's it's kind good of advice. A, oh, who, yeah. do, um, who do you consider to be reliable seed sources? I know that's a very loaded yeah. question, but it's if you can give us a couple. Yeah, so I love Victory Seeds because I know that they grow most of their seeds and the care they put into it and the scrupulous accuracy of the history. Uh, I love Southern Exposure Seed Exchange because they've been there right from the beginning of the heirloom movement and they grow at almost all of their seed. I collaborate with them a lot. Uh, Sand Hill Seed, Glenn Drowns, longtime Seed Savers Exchange member, Johnny Selected Seeds, and the Seed Savers Exchange. So those are kind of my main um, heirloom companies that I go to. You know to. how many of those are listed at the bottom of that poster <laughs> that we talked about yesterday? The, those seed oh, sources gosh. are so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Southern yeah. Exposure Seed Exchange. Yeah. Seed Savers Exchange. They're all listed. None of them have websites because the thing's so old. It doesn't have websites. I know, no. Uh, it's cool. just, it's just that I love the companies that value the integrity of the story and keep it accurate, rather than the companies that elaborate and embellish in trying to sell seeds by making something sound more than it actually is. So th there was a seed company, I won't name it, years ago that came out and was selling Cherokee Purple. And the story was, due to the fall of the Iron Curtain, we can now bring you once again this long lost bronze oh, variety. And I'm like, <laughs> So the first thing I did was email them, and the next thing they did was take down the description. <laughs> and and so um, I can't blame people for needing to make money these days. Right. It's just that the stories of heirlooms are great enough without making shit up. That's kind of okay. that's kind of the basic way I think about yeah. this. And I get really grumpy about it. I'm not. I don't do what I used to do, which is you know look around and see where all the mistakes are and contact the companies. I'm kind of like horses out of the barn. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. But part of what I like to do with my Instagram lives is take questions from people. So if they say, I ordered Lillian's yellow, it's a regular leaf, it's orange, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, that's not true. So you can go to this source. I sent it to them. So you have as good a chance as any is getting it accurate. Or if I've got spare seed, that's when I'll say, I'll send you some. Nice. Um, it's just a way to help. I, you know, I, I 
I've never done this to make money from it, or uh, it's an it's an intellectual pursuit that allows me to share what I've learned with others so that they can garden. And that's that's it. Grow great food, have fun doing it, right. meet like minded people, find a safe place that's it's a trite term, but it's it's a nice place to be in. Mm-hmm. That's what we hope we create with yeah. Yeah, Lovers Collective and Swap. Yeah. This is Cindy C all the way from the Philippines. What's the biggest dwarf beef steak that you have, Craig? So I would say the biggest one I've seen is um, I've grown a Rosella Crimson that has reached 22 ounces. And seeing seeing a 22-ounce tomato on a three-foot-tall planet is something to behold. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a big one. um, uh, What is the name of it? Kodiak King. Um, which we used, uh, that's the grizzly family, and we used large tomatoes to breed that. Those can go well over a pound. Uh, Rosella purple can reach a pound. And there there are others. Um, I, I think say I had some pretty big dwarf mahoganies last year. Dwarf mahoganies can get big. Yeah. Uh, Tasmanian chocolate can get big, but not as big as the ones I've mentioned. But what I try to do, Victory's catalog has all of the I wrote the descriptions of all 157 based on my experience. So if it's big, I will mention in there that it's really, really big. And uh, I would say the vast majority of dwarfs fall into the slicer range of maybe five, six, eight ounces, but they still have the funky flowers. You know, any of you who have grown a lot of large fruit heirlooms see the marigold blossoms, Mm -hmm. you know, flowers that are just so beautiful and complex and probably Mm -hmm. say to the bees, come get my nectar. And a lot of the dwarfs just have those. Um, the new owner of Victory, Dave, sent me some pictures and said, look at these flowers. Is this correct? I'm like, for Firebird Sweet. And I said, yep, absolutely. Um, John, I'm looking at this. Oh. Expanding your choice of Abraham Brown. Um, it's wonderful. It's a potato leaf, one pound chocolate, kind of the color of Cherokee chocolate, but it has a little more green marbling in and it's got complete flavor. So it's like a nine out of 10. And it's just one of those that Millard Murdoch got lucky because he he didn't breed his tomatoes intentionally. He let the bees do crosses and then he selected and grew from those. And, you know, if that's you what to, I did with mine. Yeah. If you go to the secret seed cartels, <laughs> right, they'll describe all of the histories of the Millard Murdoch varieties, such as Lucky Cross and Black Magic and all of that. So. Um, we have another comment from Facebook user, and if this is you, Facebook user, make sure you're sti- signed into StreamYard if you'd like to win prizes at the end, because StreamYard doesn't have you. <laughs> they got, but you've got a great comment here. Dwarfs are hands down my most favorite varieties. I have 147 on on my grow list this year, and I'm drooling, thinking about getting to taste all of them. It's amazing getting to be here to listen with y'all chat to Craig. Well, you know what um, I would love for a Facebook user? What a, what a unique name that is. But anyway, <laughs> the, the, it's a wonderful comment, and I would love for that person to send me an email. Um, Callie. Callie. Ah, hi. Hi, Callie. I would love an email from you oh, hi, letting, letting me know exactly what you think, because it doesn't do any good for us to say everything is wonderful. We need to say things like, you know, Sean's dwarf yellow is really pretty, but eh, the flavor is kind of okay. I try to do that in my description on Victory. I've got some three-star ratings because they're okay, but they may be very useful for a short season area. Or if we get all of us who are on this call together in a room, we will not agree on the flavors of tomatoes right. at all. Mm-hmm. And my blah may be another person's ah. So you just got to kind of keep that in mind and, you know, get together with people, taste together, learn each other's palates. It's really a lot of fun. Yeah, I do a lot of taste test videos on my YouTube yeah. channel. And I always say, you know, I may say I, I think this is disgusting, but I still think you should grow it because yeah. you should try it too, because you might not think it's disgusting. So <laughs> like you have, beauty. Do you have a tomato <laughs> poker face? Like when you take a bite of a tomato, will people be able to look at you and see what you think about it? Oh yeah. I mean, I had, <laughs> yes, I for had one sir. last year. <laughs> I spit it out. I couldn't even chew it up. Wait, which one was that? I forget. That was Ananez Blue, I believe. I think. Oh it was yeah, Inez right. Blue. And then Chupa Chups. <laughs> Michael. She <laughs> does not have a poker face. <laughs> no. I, I, I don't either. I did an Instagram live tasting some last year. And I, I went back and watched it because I'm like, mm, and when I went, I, I, I got <laughs> yeah. completely taken aback because it was mm-hmm. just frankly awful. Worst tomato I've ever tasted was the original 
Argon Blue P20, which I think was reselected a little bit into Indigo. Me too. That Ugh. Black Beauty and Dances with Smurfs are my three worst tomatoes. And they use OSU Blue. I know. To I know. cross everything. I don't know what the obsession is with the antho stuff. I really don't get it. If anybody has a spectacularly delicious antho, I would like to know about it. Now, I did grow Sergeant Pepper last year, and it was good. I... Six, seven, maybe seven out of ten, six and a half to seven, which is a lot better than the three or fours that I usually give mm. anthro types. Now, we do have some antho dwarfs. Uh, Mocha's Cherry may be the only release. I think uh, Anne's, they're not great, but they're pretty. And we've yeah. got one coming along that will be antho with variegated foliage. So it's like a tomato for your flower garden. Cause I like me some variegated foliage. I grew one last year. I picked it because it's a it was a uptown funk is a cross between malachite box and uh -huh. pink Berkeley tie dye two tomatoes I love. It also had a had in there indigo rose, which mm -hmm. I don't love. Mm -hmm. So I guess there was technically some antho in it, but it was so little. I loved that tomato. Yeah. It was a beautiful. There tomato. are some that have like a little bit of yeah. antho right. flavor, but it's not like Oh, some of them, like, if you look at my thumbnail of yeah. worst tomatoes, like, yeah. you can see my poker faces. I'm like. Yeah, I've grown hardly any <laughs> of them. And so I an I answered a, uh, so I'll answer this very quick. Uh, this is Annalise Ellerman, brown mm -hmm. beef steak, I would say mm -hmm. Cherokee chocolate and um, Abraham Brown by far are my two favorite chocolate beef steak. So I always had this question of. If you have a, to and Heidi knows all about this and other people who have known me for a while. I, I had this question, if you have a great tomato and a great tomato and you cross them, is the hybrid a great tomato? I wondered that too. So, yeah, so I did it with eight different pairings. And um, in seven out of eight, the hybrid was absolutely delicious. I would say on six of those, it was kind of on par with the parents. But Cherokee Purple times Lillian's Yellow created this big pink beef steak that was probably the best tomato in my garden that year, if not one of the best tomatoes I ever had. And now we're playing around with save seed because you've got Ooh. potato leaf, you've got regular leaf, you've got clear skin, you've got that dark crimsony thing of Cherokee purple. And we've gotten delicious yellows, delicious pinks, delicious kind of bicolors. Um, you know, we, uh, I, I could go on, but yes, if you love tomatoes, make a hybrid out of them, grow the hybrid, see what you think of it. I bet you'll like it. And then save seeds from that and involve lots of friends to see what kind of weirdo recombinations you can get in the F2 generation and beyond. We're getting a lot of, uh, <laughs> amateur people really interested in breeding in our yeah. group, which is really exciting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to give it a with... go someday. <laughs> You will. I bet this season you'll do it. So I'm looking at the clock. This is my natural moderator type. It's 7.59. So are you going to lose some people in a few minutes? We don't no. lose them. We usually okay. get them. Oh, in Instagram. We, <laughs> right. I'm oh, sorry. Instagram. Yes, you're right. Instagram. But oh. it looks like we don't have many on Instagram. We do have 153 viewers. <gasps> now. Wow. That's we, were, we were up to 165 a little while ago. Um, I'm obsessed with Jarson. Tomatoes. I don't know if you're familiar with those, Craig. He's a breeder from Poland. He has numbers similar to Kazula. Uh -huh. Yeah, Kazula um, is Polish too, right? Yes, Kazula, both yeah. Polish. Yeah, and he he Good uses tomatoes. a lot of Malachite box and Cherokee purple and things like that to breed. If you're watching on Instagram and you want to continue watching the conversation, tune into either mine or Jen's YouTube channel. Um, you can continue on with the conversation. Thanks for for being here. Yeah. Make sure you. You um, go onto Craig's website, we're not done. And Instagram. <laughs> um, let's get to some of our user comments. Make sure we're, we're getting. So Amanda is a, a member who grows only dwarfs, and she's actually got an accidental cross dwarf of her own named after her, her son oh, called cool. Electric Eli. I just put some seeds in my hydroponic unit because yes, she so sent me some. Thank you. So what is, <laughs> yeah. the what is the color on that out of curiosity and size? Yeah, tell us, Amanda. I think she said it was a Cherokee purple dwarf. Great. Um, mutation that was a dwarf, if I'm not mistaken. Tell us, Amanda. Let us know. Oh, here's the one who, who named loud flavor, Darla. Hi, Darla. Glad you're here. <laughs> Hi, Darla. Um, Miss Leaf, Nicole Powers Ford, what's your favorite sweet dwarf that would grow oh. well in 4A? Oh, 
Oh, so for a, I would say you're going to look for a smaller fruited variety. I would actually go for dwarf eagle smiley, which is mm. a very very early producing bright yellow, super delicious dwarf cherry tomato that actually rivals sun gold in its quality, and you'll get a ton of them, and it should do really well in that zone. I'll have to try to think through. You may want to try dwarf pink passion dwarf lemon ice and dwarf golden heart, which are all from the nosy family and they're kind of on the early side of things. And now I'm really tapping into seeing how good my memory is going to be at this <laughs> point in time. I used to have all hundred families memorized and- uh, There's a hundred families? At least, yes. Yes. Oh, Can wow. you tell us a little bit about the families with the Dwarf Tomato Project, what those are? And Yeah. So so maybe the most successful, and this is these are the ones that Petrina um, created early on. So she, she, and we started with the Disney Dwarfs. And so there's only, what, seven of those, the seven yeah. dwarfs. So we had to get really uh, creative after that. That's why we end up with things like Sleazy and, you know, we like the, <laughs> we like the E sound at the end of the name. So Petrina Cross Green Giant, which is one of my favorite large slicing tomatoes, potato leaf, green flesh, very hard to tell when it's ripe because it's clear skin with Golden Dwarf Champion, which is a burpee heirloom from the 1890s. And at the start of our project, it was only, it was one of the very few known dwarfs. And so the hybrid was a really delicious indeterminate eight ounce yellow. And then we started growing the F2 generation dwarfs. And it was like, bang, bang, bang. We had yellows, whites, and greens, both potato leaf, both regular leaf, um, four ounce root size up to a pound. And we have at least eight named varieties out of that one cross. So dwarf emerald giants, summertime green, dwarf sweet Sue, dwarf yeah. Mr. Snow, J Beauty, Barrel Beauty. It, it's just so cool. Um, we've used, um, trying to think of what Uluru ochre is from. We crossed, yeah, I'd be curious. Yeah, we crossed a purple with an orange, and that's how you got the black orange, oh, what is, okay. which is what Uluru ochre is. Now, this gave me the idea of nobody's done this yet, but I think crossing Kellogg's breakfast with Cherokee purple would give you oh. an incredible hybrid, and you would eventually find a black orange out of it one of those really dusky colors. So the if you go to Victory at the bottom of the dwarf page are all of the different families. So yeah, we did have Sneezy and Sleepy and Dopey and Doc and all of those. And then we added on, you know, that's why we got Nosy and Dreamy and Snowy and a whole bunch of others. And so what we would do is create the family. And that way, any of the F2s that we locate really promising dwarfs would be under that family name. And we used the website Tomatoville to track it because it was a P2P format and we could have like a little category for each of the families. And, um, you know, I started crossing, a guy named Vince in California started doing crosses and that's how the family list grew from seven up to well over a hundred. And there's still work to be done. It's just, I'm willing at this point to just give people F2C to play with if they like what the parents look like to see what they find. And all that. of these are OSSI, Open Source Seed Initiative, mm -hmm. pledged because we don't want to lock any of them down to any patenting or protection. It's like they're out there. All 157 are free to be used by other people to do, as crossing partners to see what you can get out of it. So this really is kind of a open arms. Here's what we do. And when I get the book out, it will describe all of the families, how we did it, what we got out of it. And I want to do a, kind of a primer on basic tomato genetics. Yes. Not like the three hundred dollar book you told me that <laughs> yeah. I could read. I opened like, it up. I closed it. <laughs> There's only one page you need to read. Only one page you need to read. <laughs> but it, I'd like to get like what's dominant and recessive about flesh color, skin color, growth habit, leaf shape, and and some things are partially dominant. Like when you use anthocyanin and tomatoes in a cross, the hybrid has partial anthocyanin in it. Um, same with stripes. If you cross a solid with a stripe. The hybrid tomatoes are faintly striped, and really? it's not and it's not until the F2 that you start getting the real distinction. So hmm. it's like the whole, you know, Forrest Gump box of chocolates thing. Once you get into this, it's addictive. Well, that's what we stop. need. We need, like, right, Jen, we need breeding tomatoes for dummies. Yeah, that's yep. what we need. Yep. I can't wait till your book comes out. Do you have Thank any you. idea when you might be finished? <laughs> If someone would <laughs> lash me to this chair and not let me leave the room for a month, um, it's it's once I get through my event clog, which is 
the next month, then I should have time to settle down. And I'm a fat, I can touch type 120 words a minute and the book's oh, wow. kind of mostly up here. Yeah. The hard chapters are going to be going back through all the data, you know, clawing mm -hmm. through Tomatoville and getting all the details in the families. I want to interview some of the people who are key to the project. So Heidi certainly will get a call for me because I think <laughs> each, each key contributor needs to have a little mini chapter on what drew them to this project? Why were they interested in it? What did they work on? And then, the, you know, the little genetics primer, the hardest thing is going to be pictures. Because I'm not a bad photographer, but I'm bad at photographing during gardening season it's because tough. it's too much to do. Right. Yeah. And even when you take pictures, you don't label them. So you don't even know what you took yeah. a picture of. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably be calling on um, some of my friends to see what they have in terms of, you know, do you have a picture of Rosella purple? Do you have a picture of, um, you know, this or that? And they would all get credit in the book. It's going to be a self-publish, you know, it could sell five copies. It could sell 50. I don't care. It's not it's going good. to sell five copies. It's, the in <laughs> it's just, I want the information accurately documented so that people understand who did this work and how it came about. Otherwise, oh, you know, so it, excited it's, good. For it. so, it's going to well, be a great you. book. You've, you've, and thank you, Amanda, Cherokee Purple Cross. Yeah. I haven't worked much with Cherokee Purple as a crossing partner. Or really, Isn't that funny? Well, really any of them. When you've got 100 families, that means you're using maybe one or two different heirlooms, you know, 50 times or something. So it would be so, so much fun to go by and re really work out a, a, one of your favorite heirlooms and see what it does when you're crossing with all kinds of different things just to see what happens. Oh, Dean is saying five million. Oh, your your text to uh, the big yeah. dude, to the big yeah, dude here. Say, someone <laughs> just said they get it. You sold Everybody one. wants the book, <laughs> so you've already sold your five yeah. copies. Yeah, there's all five. right, all right. <laughs> well, that, that is, it's it's Sue, my my wife, who's the strongest impotence because she was like when I was writing Epic Tomatoes, you have to get your book out because people are just going to take your information and she's protective of me, but she's right. Yeah. I do need to get the accurate story of this out. Right. I mean, it's all kind of in victory and it's all on Petrina's site, my website, but it needs to be in one place. So thank right. you for bringing up the book and making me feel guilty that I haven't done it yet. No, no. <laughs> just... you know, the, it's like, tomatoes can be like sorry, the game no, of telephone, can't it? Because mm. one site will have it, they'll list information that may not exactly be accurate. And then mm. I know I keep a spreadsheet of all mine, so yeah. I'll take that information and then maybe I'll share it. It can mm. really be a game of telephone if we're not getting it accurate. So I think mm -hmm. what you're doing is wonderful. Yeah. Um, this is a really interesting question. Oh, good. I'm glad you pulled it up. How do you uh, rate Tatiana? A wonderful person that gets overwhelmed, but she, um, her website to me is, is my tomato reference Bible. So the Seed Savers Yearbook and Tatiana's Tomato Base is where the first thing I do when somebody says, do you know about tomato such and such? And I'll go to the Seed Savers Exchange and look through their exchange to see if someone lists it. So I go to three places but Tatiana is, is such a time saver. And it's a wiki, which means gardeners are actually putting the information in there. And uh, I don't know if she's a seed company anymore. I know she's moved. I don't think she is, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure. I think I went and tried to buy and that yeah. you can purchase. If you can buy it somewhere, Jen and I have been there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah everybody yeah, kept yeah. telling me there were certain dwarves that I didn't have, and I'm trying to collect all of your dwarves. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. everybody kept saying, go to Tatiana's site. And I went and I'm like, I can't buy anything from there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just an incredible reference. And uh, I go there for histories because a lot of times you'll have a tomato and you know it's an heirloom. And that's where you're most likely to find some element of history to it. And I think the sad thing is, it's like genealogy. When you want to ask your parents or your grandparents some question about their life when they, when they were young and they're gone. Same thing happens with heirloom tomatoes is somebody may send us something, you're all excited, but you've never spent the time to call them up on the phone and say, now tell me everything there is to know about this tomato. And then poof, they're gone. And all you have is what you have. So... Right. With Cherokee Purple, I should have traveled to Sevierville and sat with Mr. Green and found Miss Ms. Greenlee, but I didn't. And now I'm like, damn, you know, that's like a lot of opportunity. Seriously. <laughs> well, I'm, thank, I'm, you. thank I'm goodness you did something with it, though, because yeah. Cherokee Purple could have been, you know, never <laughs> introduced to the tomato-loving world. 
Yeah. Well, and I want to thank you guys for working on the micros and for bunny hop seeds for what they're doing and all the people working on this, because I think, you know, there are, there are space challenge gardeners that will do dwarfs, but that doesn't always satisfy the greenhouse growers or the people that need something even shorter that the yeah. NASA astronauts. So I think <laughs> there is a space for, there is a huge space for micro dwarfs. I just, as I said to you the other night, I wonder what the size maximum is that you can get out of plants that are so short so get yeah. that mortgage lifter and flavor man. Yeah. And, and heidi i already told heidi i reviewed i haven't uploaded it yet but her gg's glory multi-flora micro right. is a winner because yeah. a lot of you know the old micros really lack flavor but there's some really good ones that i've, I've been reviewing lately heidi's is one of them well, my good friend uh, Justin in Wisconsin is heavily involved in, in breeding the, uh, and he he's got some good flavor ones. The first one I ever grew was Red Robin, and I'm like, it's pretty, it's productive, yeah. and eh. <laughs> it's like and, not very and good. Baker Creek, the only one they sell is Orange Hat, which is the most unfortunate um, tomato. Oh, it's awful! It's just yeah, awful. It's it looks good. cute. You're welcome, Heidi. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had a couple questions in the group that people wanted to ask. Uh, Luke, who I, I keep seeing on here and I haven't been able to pull you. There's Luke from Belgium. Um, he wanted me to ask you about how to improve soil. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, because I am a container straw bale gardener now, I don't really have to think about it. But sure. when I was an in-ground gardener, compost, 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 mix in, mm -hmm. you know, it's about the structure and getting good drainage because tomatoes hate wet feet. And it's about getting micronutrients and a balance of nutrients. Tomatoes are not the heaviest feeders in the world. So really the most important parameter to keep tomatoes happy is ensuring they're sufficiently watered so they don't stress because a stressed tomato plant will give a blossom and rotted tomato. And it's compost not a, can help with that too. Compost can help with that. It retains yep. the moisture in yes, the soil. Yes, yes. It's not about dumping a ton of calcium on. Usually there's plenty of calcium there. It's that a stressed plant can't bring the calcium up into the plant. So if you were to put drip irrigation on, on all your plants and walk out at noon on a hot day and see none of the plants wilting, you'll see so little blossom end rot. It will be great. But... You know, container gardeners, you know, this whole thing about dry farming and stuff, people don't realize that doesn't pertain to containers. That contains oh, right. to the ground where mm -hmm. the roots can go and find moisture. Right. But in containers, when that thing gets dry as dust, that tomato is going to say, screw you, buddy. Yep. I'm going <laughs> to blossom and yeah. rot these fruit. I mean, they're pretty resilient, but yeah. after a while, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Sasha. She wants to know, is rotation necessary if you're going to amend the soil? Great question. So I, what I do is I look at the performance of my plants. And if the worst that you could get, that you get are the typical fungal foliage diseases that blow in or splash up like um, early blight, alternaria or um, septoria, then I don't think you really, if you, if your soil is good and you're, you're dealing with the nutrients, I didn't rotate for years. Where you need to rotate is if somehow a really baddie gets in like fusarium wilt, because that gets into your soil and works up through the roots of the plant. And once you've got fusarium in your soil, it takes three to five years at least, not growing solanaceae crops there for that to burn itself out. So um, yeah, I, I would say you're fine. Um, I would. You don't have to rotate until your plants start really looking like they need you to rotate. So performance will start dropping, yield will start dropping, disease will start increasing. Then if then you want to get them out of there or just cover it up for a few years and put straw bales or containers, you can take advantage of the really nice sun location you had, but now you're preventing the roots from getting in there and the soil can recover. What do you do with your straw bales at the end of the season? Oh. Last year, I was filling up 20 gallon containers and putting in um, three or four pieces of seed potato, uh, you yeah. know, filling them in with the spent straw at the end and in midsummer harvesting 20 pounds of, t of potatoes out of each. Oh, uh, nice. Wow. Or, or putting them in the front of your bed, which makes it nice and loose and putting garlic cloves in the fall and then oh. that summer, beautiful. Or if you're container gardening, filling half of your container with your spent bales and mixing the other with a potting mix. So you're, you're cutting your expenses by half and you're taking advantage of all the good work that those micronutrients did to create that for you. It's like black gold. It's wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful stuff. Yeah, I have a couple of bales that I, 
I was going to grow in, but then I didn't. I was, and then so I started using a little bit of them as mulch yes. on my uh, potato bed, and then the rest of them like broke down, and I've got like this pile of just beautiful. Yeah, it's one <laughs> like you stuff. said, black gold. I'm like, I'm yeah. thinking I'm going to plant in those too. I work them into flower gardens. I work them into herb gardens. It's you know when we need mulch, that's the first thing we go for is our piles of spent bales. And uh, the thing that happens to ours is the creeping Charlie gets in from the lawn mm -hmm. and then when you go to use it you've got a bale covered with creeping charlie that you've, mm -hmm. got, to, that you've got to rip out and it does come out but um and it's very satisfying to pull that out of the straws <laughs> um but it's great um becca was talking about not nematodes something in my 40 years of gardening i've never had to deal with and uh you know <sighs> I'm not sure what you do about that, except to rotate away and don't grow any susceptible crops for some years. I mean, we've heard about the whole thing with with you know marigolds pushing them away. I don't know how effective that is. And you know, there's that book, Carrot Loves Tomatoes. My problem with any of the companion planting stuff or a lot of the garden urban legends is they may work. But as a scientist, I haven't done the control study to prove to myself they work. So I have this whole thing I always say, if something's working for you, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. I share what I do. I would never tell someone to stop doing what they're doing. But if something's not working for you, then try something I may suggest or others suggest. So, you know, the Epsom salts thing, the fish in the hole thing, I... I just, I haven't tested it to my satisfaction that it works. So my whole gardening philosophy has been, this is what I do. Everybody, this is how I do it. It's, it's not perfect. It's probably even weird in some cases. The one thing that I really um, like that I popularized, I didn't invent it, but the dense planting technique was my lifesaver because that allowed me to sell thousands of seedlings in a market with absolutely no greenhouse by just packing those little seeds into their cells and getting, there you go, wow. 20, and getting 2,500 seedlings in a one by two foot footprint. And then just having the blast of putting on the radio and opening a beer and transplanting for hours in the garage. <laughs> and you know, every plant would make it. It's tomato. really? tomatoes yes. are so, so incredibly resilient mm -hmm. because any part of the stem that goes under the potting mix will root. So even if you snap off the roots, just bury it deep, leave it in the garage for a week under the lights, boom, you've got a plant. That's what I, I tell everybody in the group, they're like, I've got this issue. What do you do? My answer is always the same. Bury it. Bury it. <laughs> it, I, it works. And I yes. bury everything. I plant yeah. peppers, eggplant, lettuce. I didn't greens, know you could bury herb, peppers. Everything, yeah. everything. I do. Yeah. Yeah. What it is is there's a lot of there's a lot of books that say do this, not that. And right. I am such a rule breaker that I say, yep. why, why shouldn't I try that? Mm -hmm. And then you find it works great. Now, the things with pepper and eggplants is they don't root as quickly. So whereas a tomato will show roots on the stem within a week or so, it may take eggplants and peppers. But what I like about yeah. burying the stem is you're you're taking away the most vulnerable part. So if you're out in a windy day or a chilly day, that stem is now underground where it's not going yep. to get damaged. And that thing's not going to flop around, potentially snap, and boom. It's we we freak out about these tiny little differences early in the season, but then we forget in a month later everything kind of looks the same and it's happy. So don't sweat mm -hmm. the small stuff, particularly yeah. early on. And another thing about burying things, mm. I have noticed that if you start your stuff too early yeah, that's <laughs> and what you're up by yep. burying it gives you a little bit more room before those plants are smashing on the light. And you, and, <laughs> and you know, I've told people, let's say you plant your plants way too early and now you've got a two foot cherry tomato flopping in the wind, snip the top six inches of it off, stick it in a glass of water, roots in a week, you've got yourself a plant that is now perfect height to plant out. So there is always a way to save a tomato plant unless a cutworm gets it, you don't see it for two days and the sun has desiccated it. But you can even save that if you get it in time. There, there's just so many ways. And you I start my seeds halfway down. Yeah. Yeah. Container. yeah. And I did that, that way I, this year. I, I have just, to, yeah. I bury the soil. I keep adding more soil. Yeah, and yeah. My things are monsters, but I love your dense planting is very intriguing. Yeah. Well, you know, what you're doing is kind of the potato process where you put right. potatoes and in, in a little bit of straw. And then as the plants grow, 
you just fill the container up and then it will produce potatoes all the mm -hmm. way up the pot to the top. So Dean says he's been doing dense planting for two years now with tomatoes and peppers now, Good. thanks to you, Craig. Well, <laughs> my pleasure. And, uh, you know, I, I don't really want people to ever say I invent these things. What I do is I, I may see them somewhere subliminally, but then it's like, um, it's the need that drives it. It's like, man, how am I going to get 8,000 seedlings? I'm just going to try planting 80 seeds in a cell and see what happens. But then when you see how much fun it is to transplant, it, it's just, it, it's a Zen moment. You know, you do need kind of gentle hands, you need lots of patience. And the other thing I've done is, a, let's say I'm transplanting a tray of 18 Cherokee purples. I just put in one tag. So when I'm transplanting, I don't do the labeling. Then it's a nice day, you know, the breeze is blowing. I'll just sit out and write labels for an hour. I just need to oh, make sure that idea. I just want need to make sure that label doesn't get dislodged by one of my pets right. or by clumsy <laughs> me because it's like, oh no, what is and then, this? There was a what comment happened? up here. Somebody was listening, not paying attention, and they now have two unknown varieties. What do you do about do you ever get an unknown? Because to me, I can't deal with growing an unknown. I, I, grow, I can grow like an F2 yeah. where I know the crosses and like, I'm excited to see how that comes out, but like a complete unknown, I can't handle that. Um, so <laughs> an, un an unknown gives you decisions to make. So I'm, I'm a scientist on one hand and I'm in insanely curious on the other. So I will grow an unknown just to see what it is. And then I will play the game of what could this be? You know, <laughs> ask the person who sent it to me, or if it's my seed saved, I look on the map. What it, did, was there any tomato of this color in my garden last year? Or could it be a cross of two varieties? And then I look. So, you know, I've done that a lot for friends where I'll send them seeds and they'll say, whoop, got a potato leaf here or got a regular leaf there. And I'll find my map and I'll say, I bet you this is a cross between this and that. They grow it out, save seeds. The next year they're like, yep, that's what the F2 is showing. It was a cross between this and that. So oh, I do cool. crosser puzzles all the time. So give me, it's give me your starving, give me, no, for me, <laughs> give me, for me, it's give me your mysteries, give me your problems, because I love to, it, to me, it's the just fun. Solver. It's just fun to solve. Uh, Again, we're getting ready to wind down in a couple minutes. So make sure you type in hashtag tomato, because we're going to give away some prizes um john kramer has donated two books a paperback and a hardcover Thank craig's you, going to sign them add some seeds and ship it to you so there's two of those jen's giving away a book craig will also sign and i'm giving away some dwarf tomato seeds yes so and the people who are going to get the two books are also going to get a copy of the straw bale book and they're going to get three dwarfs and three indeterminates so that's your little oh, wow. gift pack. thank you very that's generous yes Thank you that's so awesome much. Make sure you get in it. Any last questions you may have. Um, this has been so much this, fun. This has been incredible. I, I, I kind incredible. of feel like I chat, I was blabby, but I was I having a it. blast. I, I <laughs> they're not here to hear. They're not here to listen no. to us, Craig. Everybody was here for you. We had, we had 165 live viewers a few minutes ago. This is fantastic. Oh, wow. Um, Very exciting. Oh, D, D says number Number 36 came up and I didn't plant anything there. It's now listed as, I don't know, and it's driving me crazy, but I can't get rid of it. So here's the challenge of dense planting is if you if you plant them very shallow like I do, but you're not careful about your watering, you can get cell to cell migration. So often, if you've got tomatoes of different leaf shape, you know, if you've got Lillian's yellow here and Cherokee purple there and one potato leaf is in your Cherokee purple, you know that Lillian's yellow floated in and got into your cell. It, but you just got to be careful with that because you can make a mistake. You know, if you're a seed saver and sharing seeds, you don't have to separate by a ton if you focus on the first cluster of fruit before the bees get in and start really buzzing your plants. But if you need to be 100% sure, just bag your blossoms before they open, let the tomatoes form. Once the tomatoes form, mark that because you then know that every tomato that was on that cluster is going to be pure. So it's, you know, for seed saver, if you've got a super rare variety and you want to keep it pure, it's really good to bag it. But you'll get 98% purity if you just save from that lowest cluster because the bees really are not interested in tomatoes at that point. That's and, a good point. I never thought yeah. about oh, that. Yeah. That's how I can yeah. grow 150 tomatoes in my yard and have like hardly any cross pollination. Yeah. Yeah. Just all save from the first tomatoes. And there is no truth to the rumor that if you save from the largest, the smallest, the most crack free, every every seed and every tomato on the plant as long as it's stable is exactly the same. So you could you could save seeds from the ugliest, most cat-faced tomato 
grow it next year and it could be absolutely perfect. So cat facing is physiological only. It's caused by conditions. The seeds are absolutely fine. These and other fascinating facts I will share with you next time I join you, but it's I, like, will you, you, got me, you got me in a come back. Another fun fact that is that I've heard that, uh, saving from a, a good plant, not like a good looking, That's fruit, it. a good plant. It doesn't matter if the fruit's disgusting looking. If your plant is healthy and it's doing really well, those are the, that's the plant you want to save the seeds from. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually kind of a variation on that. that. So that's called single plant selection, which is how Livingston finally figured out how to improve the tomato. So if you were to plant 12 Cherokee purples and one plant is clearly better, if you save seeds from that plant, you're probably saving seeds from something where there's a slight genetic difference and you're, you're on your way probably to creating a new variety that you could either oh. call it Jen's Cherokee Purple, but by growing at a population of a variety. So what, what living old seed companies used to plant out tomatoes and do just what I said, save it from the earliest fruit, the most crack uh, resistant fruit, and then they'd get no improvement at all. And it was Livingston that planted say 2000 of one variety and he looked for the one or two plants that had the superior tomato on it. And that was the basis of his new variety. And by doing single plant selection from a population, he started creating new tomatoes left and right. Mm -hmm. So that is how you actually, if, if the seed is good, I, I should be able to plant 25 Cherokee purple plants and see no difference at all. If you start seeing differences, then you're starting to pick up some genetic instability in your seed stock. And you probably should cull the ones that are different than all the rest because that's an in, it's either an inferior um, example or it's something that's been crossed up a little pollen. But we can we can do this again and cover maybe focus more on genetics and just get oh, into that. Can we? Yes, yeah. can we? Yeah. Yay. Yay. Because there's a lot here to unwrap. And I it's, know. And I'm and just like much to pack into the last five. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we can get um, into dominant things and you know. Oh some... yes, I would love that. Thank you all for, so for being here. Thank you to Craig. This has been a fantastic episode. Um, well, you guys are great. So I'm just so delighted to make new Thank friends you. and because uh, you know me, I actually am not that far out there. I give a lot of talks, but I've. I've kind of controlled my environment because I can't get out there too much. And so I don't, I'm not a joiner. So this is, the, <laughs> I was really looking forward to this. Oh, well, thank you. We so were telling, we. Craig, yeah, we told Craig the story yesterday. It was after, I think maybe our January or February show. I got up the guts to, to email Craig, yeah. totally thinking like he's going to say, oh, it's planting season. Yeah, no, maybe no, no, it's no, no, in no. the future. No, mm -hmm. he, so it was Jen, Michael, and I talking after the show. <laughs> Email came in from Craig. I'm like, oh, should I read it? Squealing, squealing yeah. like pigs. Like, yeah, we're yeah, like... for sure. <laughs> well, you guys, you guys are too kind, but this is just absolutely my pleasure. So let's give away some prizes. And thank you guys. I, I apologize. There were so many comments coming in. Um, so much fun. So it was so much fun. Make sure you catch Craig on his Instagram channel, which is, uh, let me pull that up here. Um, where did it go? Uh, NC Tomato Man. And his website is craigwhoolier.com. <laughs> if you're not a member of our Facebook group, why not? Um, yes, it really is a great community. We would love to have you at Tomato Lovers Collective and Swap. Uh, beginners and seasoned growers alike. And if anybody has a burning question that didn't get answered here, just shoot it to me in an email and I'll get back to you and I'll actually shoot it to Lauren and Jen as well, if you wanted to share it with the group next for your Thank next. You. Thank you. Let's give away some prizes. So John Kramer, I already mentioned him. Thank you, John. Thank you again, Craig, Jen. Um, let's give away some prizes. So if you win, um, you can contact either Jen or myself, and we will get point you in the right direction. If you're not in the Facebook group to private message us, um, I'm going to put my email in the comments. You can email me and I'll send it to Jen or Craig or wherever. So L-E-R-N-I-E at me.com. Otherwise, if you're in the Facebook group, just private message. Um, so let's see, what do we have here? Let's give away the two, two books from, from John and Craig Seed, that whole seed mix. That'll be really nice um, gifts. So this will be two... 
two members getting this. And thank you again, Craig, for this. I can't read this fast. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> First one, Haley. Oh, Haley. Congratulations, Haley. Okay, and the next one. You guys are so much more sophisticated than my Instagram lives. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are really a hot mess. Um, <laughs> but we have, we're a hot mess with heart, right, Jen? Yes. Cereal we'll spinner. Keep, keep it real. Yay. Yeah. Congratulations to both of you. I'm going to try to do a live tomorrow morning while I up pop my tomatoes all by myself, Lauren. Oh, are you good? Good. I'll be I'm on my way to Massachusetts. I'm going to do it. Massachusetts. I, I guess, I, I, I don't know. I get so inside my head. I don't know why. Ben goes, I, I said something and he goes, um, I said, you know, if there's people there, that's cool. And he goes, you you get upset because what if there's not people there? Like, yes. <laughs> they will be there. You know, they but will be like, there. Like you said, Craig, you know, there might only be like five people watching then, but then you wake up in the morning and, you know, you've got 40 or 50 views then. You, then so you, know, my, more than I, that. you have 500. My Instagram lives <laughs> tend to, so I'll have 25 or 30 people live because I never know there are odd times. And then in a week, I've had 2,100 views. So right. it's, people do go on and watch them watch at their time. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah. just got to get past myself. I. You will be great. I would offer to help. I'll be on my way to Massachusetts Thank tomorrow. You. So um, speaking of, I forget what you were saying. <laughs> I don't know. It made me think of this, but um may next month our episode is just going to be jen and i and then in june we're having author william alexander on the show <laughs> author of the 64 dollar tomato and 10 tomatoes that changed the world he's going to be our june guest so we're excited about that i'm reading 10 tomatoes that changed the world right now it's a good oh one. that book is so full of so it's much good. information <laughs> I, had a little, I had a little chat with william actually when i first moved in here when he was writing that book so we had a we had a nice long chat about cherokee purple and other things so um, I think he mentions you in the book, yeah. does he not? Yeah. I, I, I no? don't know. I haven't. I haven't looked. I'm. I'm. Uh, <laughs> I. I don't read garden books very much because I'm too busy kind of doing yeah. my own thing right now, and that's just one of. Those I listened things. on Audib Audible. It was really good. Okay. Um, all right, Jen. Let's give away your book next, huh? Okay. And then Craig's going to give a nameplate, so who will sign that for you too? Yep. So this is for Jen's copy of Epic Tomatoes. Sathya, congratulations, Sathya. Okay. And Jen, and Jen, when I send the book plate, I'll tuck a straw bale book in with some seeds with that, so you can make it a complete set. Thank oh, you. Great. Thank you. Very nice, Craig. That's so sweet. I would I would love a nameplate for my personal sure. book if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to give away two sets of seeds of these are all dwarfs. Andy's forty dwarf awesome, which was my favorite, mm -hmm. one of my favorite tomatoes of all last year. Bundaberg Rumble mahogany. Uh, sweet scarlet dwarf which is my favorite red and i don't really like reds normally but that was a delicious one and dwarf wild fred so i'll give two of these and then we're all set we're all good to go named after my dad wilfred what wild fred yeah he uh, he, yep. was a, he was the custodian in his church and one day they misprinted his name in the program and as Wild Fred Lahulier. I love that. And I decided after he passed away, I wanted to name a tomato after him. So that be, his Fred. favorite tomato was Cherokee purple. So I wanted to name a purple tomato. Oh, after I love him. that. Okay, Miss Leaf Nicole Powers Ford, message me and I'll get you those seeds. And then we'll have one more to give and then we're sadly edited. Yeah, me and my husband did a review on Wild Fred. And I- oh, cool. It was a good one. I gave that little tidbit of information that was yeah. after your dad. Yeah, I, I, I found that tomato. I was so excited when I found it. It's not Teresa. the absolute best of the 157, but it's a damn good tomato. So <laughs> I liked it. Yeah. 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 It's a it great, great tomato. Congratulations, mm -hmm. Teresa. And congrats to all of you. Yes, Thank you congrats, for Teresa. being here. Craig, we are totally going to take you up on coming back if you've seen yeah. it. We would love cool. to have you back. Oh, yes. I actually enjoy this doing, I, I don't mind doing my PowerPoint talks, but being able to just kind of riff with, with friends is is just, it's all about that. So, well, yeah, thank you was. for putting up with my verbosity. It oh, was, it, oh, it was <laughs> wonderful. It wasn't at all. Yeah, it was great. Um, so, yeah, we will see you guys next month. Michael, our producer, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And, um, Michael. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in live. And for those of you watching the recording, we honor you also. Hope you enjoy the episode. And we'll see you next month. Peace, love, get your gratitude on. Go grow tomatoes. 
Enjoy your day. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.